So we're talking about fear here today, fear. It's a major thing. Fear is a major factor in everybody's life. You know, it's one of the primary drivers, fear and desire, the base drivers that drive all of us. Uh, and there isn't a human being alive on the planet who hasn't and doesn't experience fear in one of its many forms from time to time. But what I want to discuss in this video is how really 99.9% .9 of the fear that most people feel is utterly redundant. It's fear of things that aren't real threats, but they're perceived threats, okay? But they look like real threats. They seem like real threats. They get processed as real threats um, when we experience them, okay? Now, I just want to make it clear what I'm talking about when I'm talking about fear here. Some people watching this video might say, well, you know, I don't really experience that much fear. Um, because they think of fear as being a very powerful, very overwhelming thing, and it can be. So I'm thinking about fear in all its forms, from the powerful and overwhelming, to the subtle, to the barely perceptible. But nonetheless, even subtle, barely perceptible fear operates as a driver upon us. So to give, to give some illustrations of this, you know, you might have somebody that, that has a fear of public speaking, and if they had to give a presentation in public beforehand, they'd have sweaty palms, they'd feel sick, they'd feel nauseous, every fiber of their being would be screaming, get out, because they would be processing some kind of threat, you see, that's why they're feeling the fear. It's very strong, very overwhelming. Or you may get somebody else who has uh, a very subtle, fear and they're just it, it comes out as a procrastination subtle procrastination they're not getting round to replying to an email or something like that there's no overt fear involved but there's a there's an avoidance going on and there's there's a structure behind it and we could call this a very subtle kind of fear an old mentor of mine steve chandler he used to say you're either rising up in life or you're laying low you're either striding forward or you're hanging back. And if you're hanging back, if you're laying low, there's a reason for that, and that reason is fear. Maybe powerful fear, maybe subtle fear, but it's fear because it's the fear that's keeping you safe. By lying low, you're staying safe. By hanging back, you're staying safe. By avoiding giving the presentation, you're staying safe. By avoiding going to the social situation, you're staying safe. By avoiding, uh, you know, chatting up the prospective partner you're you're staying safe maybe by avoiding the emails you're staying safe maybe by not picking up the phone you're staying safe maybe by not moving forward with that business idea you're staying safe and underneath of all of it there's fear now I nearly called this video social fear is a crude mechanism this is what I nearly called this video um, but I realized by putting social fear in the title of the video, a lot of people would, would overlook it thinking, well, that doesn't apply to me, you see. Because people don't actually realize that most of the fears they have in their life are social fears or psychosocial fears. They aren't fears um, born out of real threat in the physical world. They are fears born out of perceived threats in the psychosocial world. Now the thing is, our mind, our body, it doesn't know any different. Fear is fear is fear. When we feel fear and we experience fear, it doesn't make any difference whether it comes from a genuine physical threat to us or from a uh, constructed psychosocial threat. Now, I don't want to speak in jargon here, so I'm going to give an example of, of what I mean. Fear, is, fear serves a function. I said, you know, social fear is a crude mechanism. It's a mechanism. Fear serves a function. There is biological value in fear. This is why we have evolved a fear system. Okay, it is there to keep us from danger. It is there to keep us safe. But it's a crude mechanism. You know, all fear is a crude mechanism, especially social fear. And all fear is around processing of risks to self. This is what's at the basis of fear, risk to self. We're evaluating and processing risks to self in our physical and psychosocial environment uh, and we, we respond to those. So let's, let's look at uh, the different types of fear. The fear of, of physical uh, threat to self in the physical world versus fear of threat to self in the psychosocial world. 
Um, and the reason I'm bringing this distinction in is because I, I want to show that while we confuse them, they're quite distinct things. While they feel the same, they're very distinct. So fear in the physical world, what's fear for? Well, fear is there to keep us safe. So imagine a scenario uh, where you're transported back uh, many thousands of years. You live maybe in a hunter-gatherer, small tribe or something like that. And uh, there's, there's a cave. You come, you come across a cave with a, with a friend of yours and your friend says, you know, there's a, there's a whole stash of fruit in that cave. Um, and you say, really? Cool, we need the fruit. And you say, yeah, it's uh, the, the bear that lives in the cave collects and stashes the fruit. And you go, oh, and he says, why don't you go in and get the fruit? He doesn't want to go in and get the fruit. He says, why don't you go in and get the fruit? And you're going, ooh. And suddenly you have fear inside of you. Fear lurching up. And the fear makes sense because you're processing a risk. Because you could go in the cave and you could get literally, physically, ripped apart by a bear. There is a threat to you as an organism, okay? A physical threat. Your life could be ended, okay? A threat to self. So you feel this, this strong physical fear and it's there to act as a driver, to drive you away from, from going into the cave. And of course, the interesting thing about it is there may or may not be a bear in the cave. There may or may not be a bear in the cave. Your friend may be lying to you, your friend may be misinformed, maybe there is a bear but the bear's not in. But regardless of the actual facts, you feel the fear. You see, because you don't feel the facts, you feel your thinking around it, you feel your processing. But this is a useful thing, okay? Because heuristically, as, as, a, as a way of being, it has biological value because generally it works to keep you safe and our ancestors managed to avoid being ripped apart by enough creatures to pass on their genes and here we are today. So there is a biological value in the fear mechanism. This is why it's uh, evolved, but it's a crude mechanism because it doesn't, our fear, our feeling of fear contains no information in it about the actual world. It is just a creation of our thinking about the world. And of course, what we think about the world isn't actually necessarily the world. Sometimes there's a closer match, Sometimes the match is, is further away. So fear makes good sense. You know, it, it makes sense. It keeps us sharp. It moves us away from danger. But that sense of fear, that feeling of fear, that sensation of fear, for the person avoiding going into the, the bear's cave and being ripped apart, somebody else might feel it when they go to give a presentation you know, for work. They, they're required to give a presentation and suddenly they, they're preparing it and at the thought of going up and doing it and the closer and closer it gets to giving the presentation, the more everything locks up, the more every fiber of their being screams for them to escape and uh, the feeling's the same as about, you know, as if you're about to go into the bear cave. It's the same uh, physiologically generated sensation, but the thought processes that are generating it are different. But in this instance, the interesting thing is, whilst a bear can actually physically tear you apart, there is no physical harm that can really come to you as a result of giving your presentation. Now, of course, you could argue in some far out situation, maybe, Somebody would be so outraged by your, the, the appallingness of your presentation, they'd leap up on stage and physically attack you. But that isn't really what most people are processing when they're processing a fear of public speaking, for example. Or it might be a fear of networking, it might be a fear of showing up at a party, it might be a fear of going on a date, it might be a fear of answering the door for some people, you know. The same thing is true on all of them. For all of them though, there is, a, there is a, a processing of threat. There is threat. There is a risk being processed. But it's not a risk to the physical self. It's a risk to um, our self-image. Our self-image. It's an existential threat, but from a, a psychological, not a physically existential threat, but a psychologically existential threat. And the reason it exists is because we're caught up in a whole bunch of ideas and confusions about what we are and how life works. You see, 
vast, the vast majority of, of adults in the Western world, um, or at least a really, you know, a really good proportion of them, are of a developmental phase. I'm just going to mention a sign. I'm a big fan of uh, Robert Keegan's developmental psychology and, and his model of development. I don't want to get too far into that right now. But you know, the vast majority of adults in the Western world are in a phase uh, what in Robert Keegan's system is sometimes called the socialized mind. And one of the key elements, the key aspects of the socialized mind is we tend to process other people's opinions and thoughts about us through our sense of self. What this means is we tend to make other people's experience of us part of our experience of ourselves. Or more specifically, what we think other people's experience of us is. So what that means is I have a self-image, I have a way of seeing myself, and in order to feel okay about myself, I have to have a reasonably robust self-image. I have to have a self-image that says I'm okay, right? So that's fine. If that's being constructed by me from the inside out, by my principles, by my values, by all of that, that's fine. I'm grounded, I'm solid, I'm inside of that. But if I'm uncertain about who I am, you know, if I'm, if I'm confused on a deeper level, I don't really have a deeper sense of grounding about me. I'm not living from a self-authoring place in life. Uh, I'm always looking around to get information about me and who I am and my value. Because I'm not certain, you see, I'm not really in the driving seat. So I end up looking out to the world around me and other people, especially the social world. I end up looking out and, and kind of using other people and other situations as mirrors to tell me about me. Right? So that's, that's why I'm always looking for other people's opinions. This is why people are very bad at processing feedback. They get all hurt and take it personally. This is why people cannot bear rejection. You know, I've, I've coached many guys across the years who were unable to go up and strike up conversations with, uh, with ladies that they would like to meet because they feared rejection. You know, what's that about, that fear of rejection? It's not like they're going to be ripped apart by a bear. They may use metaphors like that. You know, the guy going up to do the public speaking may say, uh, oh, you know, they'll tear me apart. But it's a metaphor, you see, although on one level it's being processed like reality. So, so this is the thing, people are vulnerable because of how they are psychologically um, constructing and reconstructing their sense of self. So they're vulnerable and, and it's as if their sense of self can be damaged by other people's opinions of them or other people's reactions to them because they're making that person's image of them part of their own image of themselves, you see. So it feels like the judgment of others can hurt me, can damage me, but actually it can't. In reality, it's all based on a misunderstanding. It's based on the misunderstanding that who I think I am is who I am. It's based on the misunderstanding of how I see myself is how I am. It's based on the misunderstanding that all the stories I tell myself about myself are myself. As Alfred Korzybski would have put it, it's a mistake of the map and the territory. It's a deep mistake, a deep misunderstanding, you see. But the truth of the matter is, is the stories that I tell myself about myself are not me. They are not who I am. They cannot be me because I am not stories. You know, the thoughts I have about myself cannot be me because I am not made of thoughts. You know, the, the, the words I say about myself cannot be me because I am not made of words. You know, I am the thinker of the thoughts. I'm not made of the thoughts. Um, so, so there's a confusion there, you see. But if I don't recognize that and I'm unconsciously centered in that confusion, I think that's the way it is, suddenly other people's opinions other people's reactions, all of this kind of stuff, it feels dangerous. There's danger there. It's mind-made danger, but it's danger. Now, the truth of the matter is, really what anybody thinks of me, or anybody thinks of you, or whatever, I'm using me as an example, what, what anybody thinks of me 
changes absolutely nothing about who I am. If somebody's pleased with me in one moment and then they are unhappy with me in the next, of course, I'm already distorting reality by saying they're pleased with me, unhappy with me. These are distortions because really they're, they're pleased because they're feeling their pleasing thinking or they're unhappy because they're thinking they're feeling their unhappy thinking. You know, they're feeling their unhappy story that they've made up about me. Um, the truth is nobody can feel me, so they can't be pleased with me. I kind of pleased them or anything like that. Um, but yeah, the, the truth of the matter is, is regardless of their perspective or their opinion or their judgment, nothing changes about me. Somebody can think I'm great one moment and they can think I'm a complete uh, bastard the next minute, but I'm still the same, you know. Just like this sofa I'm sat on. I could think this is a wonderful sofa one minute and then the next minute I could think it was a terrible sofa and actually it's time to replace it or I don't like that sofa anymore. Nothing's changed about the sofa just because my perspective or opinion of it's changed. Nothing's changed about the sofa. So when somebody's opinion or perspective changes about me, nothing actually changes about me. It cannot impact me that way cannot damage me as, a, as an organism. It cannot, unlike a bear which can rip me apart, when a bear pulls its claws through my flesh, my flesh is rent asunder and I may well be maimed or killed as a result. You see, the physical threat is a real threat. The claws go through me. But the metaphorical claws that I experience if somebody uh, rejects me or mocks me or whatever. They're not real. As an organism, nothing's changed. I'm still alive. Everything is fine. I'm still alive. And if I'm in a good state of mind, I'm still dynamic and I'm still responsive, you see. So, social fear is often very problematic and it holds people back in life. They're, they're creating all sorts of mind-made threats and illusions that aren't really real. Now, at some level, there's a biological value to that as well. But it's important to see that within a developmental context. When we're kids, when we're still evolving, we need to find a way of assimilating uh, social norms and this kind of thing and figuring out what's what. It's a useful stage of development. But it's not one to get stuck in. There's an old Chinese expression that says, just because the boat is useful for you in helping you cross the lake, doesn't mean that you should carry it on your back for the rest of the journey. Now, social fear is a developmental tool. It serves us at a particular stage of development during childhood you know, and, and adolescence, especially during adolescence. It serves us in sharpening our awareness for things, in starting to pay attention to things. It serves us. But once we've been living with it for a while, once we've assimilated a bunch of stuff, we outgrow its usefulness. It becomes like the boat. We've crossed the lake. We don't actually need it anymore, but we can't let go of it, so we're holding it on our back, and now it's weighing us down. So one, it's important for us to figure out how to fit in and figure out unconsciously the rules of the game when it comes to, uh, to living socially. Once you've figured out the rules, that's when, to, when you want to transcend the rules and be able to break the rules. And if you're still carrying social fear, you, you can't transcend and break the rules. Incidentally, the rules that you have are just your rendering of how social stuff is supposed to work. You know, it's not how it is, it's just your rendering. So there's a point that comes in life where it's time to go beyond those fears. It's time to start trusting yourself as being a bit more switched on than you were when you needed those fears. You've gone beyond that, you're more switched on now. Maybe you don't know it yet. Of course, it's difficult to know if you've been caught up in the fears to know that you don't need the fears anymore. You've already gone beyond it. But it can be really hard to drop them be really hard to let go because the mind-made illusions that create the fears can grab us and when they've grabbed us and we're inside of them we see the world through them and we think we're seeing the world as it is not as we're creating it through our fear I, 
I know that this video is some people are going to watch this video and they're going to be like mm, not really getting what you're saying James some people will be watching this video and it will be triggering something it will be putting a light on and you'll you'll get that sense you'll know it's true you know what it's like which psychosocial fears drive your life and you probably are starting to get a sense of of when they're hindering you so you already know you're at that place where they're holding you back you've crossed the lake you're carrying the boat it's time to drop them it's time to let them go but it's just not that easy because it just keeps happening the fears keep coming up they keep grabbing you you go to rise up in life and the fears they come up like tentacles and drag you back down and you know it's time to go beyond them you know it's time to rise above them but just breaking free is a challenge so I work with lots of clients on this kind of stuff this is the kind of work that I generally do um, but what I would like to do what I'm going to do is I'd like to for the first time work with a group around this so I'm I've decided I'm going to put on a workshop it's two days before I leave my offices it's a one-day workshop it's super short notice it's gonna happen on the 4th of October which is a Sunday it's gonna run from 10 o'clock in the morning to half past five six o'clock in the evening and I'm gonna work with a group of ten people and we're going to go deep into the aim of the day is to create a shift in consciousness a profound shift in consciousness which enables everybody in the group to start seeing themselves and seeing the mechanisms of life in a radically different way and coming to the realization that in truth 99.9% .9 of the time in fact when it comes to the psychosocial stuff you are bulletproof. You're bulletproof. All of the mind-made threats, all of the mind-made risks, they're not really real. It doesn't work like that. There are certain understandings that when you grasp them, you will realize that the things that you have been fearing cannot harm you. They cannot hurt you. They cannot knock you down. They cannot hold you back. There is a shift in consciousness and a shift in understanding that will enable you to go way beyond those and become free. Free to start living as the I that chooses. So when you choose, I'm going to give that presentation. I'm going to go up and speak to that person. You can choose to do so and be you at your best. Because you know that you at your best isn't the you that's gripped with fear worry and anxiety and all of that you know there's another version of you you know if you drop out of that trance into a broadband state if you have full access to your full resourcefulness of course it doesn't guarantee perfection but you can be alive you can live in the moment you can be responsive and that's when you're going to be able to really surf the chaos wave of life you know you're going to have that that adaptability not by being rigid with fear not by being shut down not by having the oxygen drained out of the front of your brain by fear and ended up working on your primitive brainstem mechanisms that's not that's you know it's, it's it's time to go beyond that you know it if you know this if this makes sense you know this so this is what we're doing with this workshop this day it's called bulletproof because that's what you are you know metaphorically bulletproof psychosocially bulletproof there is nothing catastrophic that can happen to you there is nothing that is any kind of big deal there is nothing that that there's no existential threat there it isn't really there it's all mind made it's all illusory um, and that's the consciousness shift we're going for with this day a shift in consciousness we want a transcendent consciousness a transcendent consciousness one that is ending those trances of fear where you've been processing risk in the world that isn't really there that's what we're going for with everyone in the room and I know from experience here everyone in the room the people in the room are going to make different levels of shifts some people are going to make big shifts some people are going to make small shifts and it will be just opening a door for further possibilities but if you're watching this and this is making sense to you already that's a good sign that you're in a right in the right place to take advantage of this now as I mentioned this is um, it's the last workshop I'm doing in my office and it is going to be 10 people only and I'm doing this at a ridiculously tiny tiny price okay um, check it out check out the details check out the information get yourself a ticket get yourself a place they will not hang around for long 
Uh, and if you do have any questions ahead of time, if you've got time to ask them, I suspect that the, the places will go quite quickly. But if you, if you do have questions, there'll be a comments section somewhere in this video that you can uh, ask them via. Okay, I believe that's all I need to say. Uh, looking forward to meeting some of you, and maybe some of you that I've already met before, uh, on the 4th of October at my offices in Letchworth Garden City, Hertfordshire. Take care.